this constructive manifesto for landscape architecture was compiled by borrowing from earlier documents, which I'll identify. It was produced in the belief that landscape architecture has drawn too much from cubism and neoplasticism and not enough from constructivism and suprematism. Here goes. Above the tempests of our weekdays, across the ashes and cindered homes of the past, before the gates of the vacant future, we proclaim today to you people for whom landscape architecture is no mere ground for conversation, but the source of real exaltation, our word and deed. Design is still nourished by impression, external appearance, and wanders helplessly back and forth from naturalism to symbolism, from romanticism to mysticism. The attempts of the cubists and futurists to lift the visual arts from the bogs of the past have led only to new delusions. Neither futurism nor cubism has brought us what our time has expected of them. In life, only the active is beautiful and wise and strong and right. For life does not know beauty as an aesthetic measure. Efficacious existence is the highest beauty. Space and time are the only forms on which life is built, and hence art must be constructed. The plumb line in our hand, eyes as precise as a ruler, in a spirit as taut as a compass, we construct our work as the universe constructs its own, as the engineer constructs his bridges, as the mathematician his formula of the orbits. We renounce the thousand-year-old delusion in art that held the static rhythms as the only elements of the plastic and pictorial arts. We affirm in these arts, a new element, the kinetic rhythms, as the basic forms of our perception of real time. These are the fundamental principles of our work and our constructive technique. At the start of the 21st century, landscape architecture is a troubled profession, more distinguished by what it lacks than the qualities that it actually possesses. It has no historiography, no formal theory, no definition, direction or focus. We believe these problems are pervasive and chronic. They indicate that landscape architecture is not just troubled, but sick. Landscape architects must plan and design landform, water, vegetation, paving and buildings to create a public realm with good social, visual and environmental qualities. We must design open spaces for public use, for the future and for pleasure. The landscape profession gives too much and too little attention to the mid-19th century. Too much because the art we practice is more than 10,000 years old. Too little because the formative period for modern landscape architecture was the early 19th century, when the principle of creating public goods was set. The second half of the first century BC was also foundational. This is when our social, visual and environmental objectives were formulated by Vitruvius Pollio as... Utilitas, firmitas, and venustas. But we can look further back. The savage was the first to establish the principle of naturalism. In drawing a dart and five little sticks, he attempted to transmit his own image. 
This first attempt laid the basis for the conscious imitation of nature's forms. Hence arose the aim of approaching the face of nature as closely as possible. The first inscription of the savage's primitive depiction gave birth to collective art, or the art of repetition. Yet, it is only in the present century that the collective landscape has emerged as a social necessity. We are promoting a landscape art on a scale never conceived of in history. The sources for these statements were 1. The Suprematist Manifesto, published by Kazimir Malevich in 1915. Its title was From Cubism and Futurism to Suprematism, and it emphasised the supremacy of pure artistic feeling. 2. The Constructivist Manifesto, published by Naum Gabo and Antoine Pevsner in 1920. Its title was The Realistic Manifesto, and it called for a new art based on the real laws of life. 3. An essay by Homan and Langhorst. It was published in 2004 as an apocalyptic manifesto. 4. Jeffrey and Susan Jellicoe's book on The Landscape of Man was published in 1975, though I managed to buy my copy in 1974 and still cherish it as the best account of the art we practice. And 5. An article by Robert Holden and Tom Turner. It was published in 2014 on Google Play with the title Landscape Architecture Manifestos, Constructivist, Apocalyptic and Optimistic. When artists publish manifestos, they're often accompanied by examples. For a landscape architect, this is more difficult. But I will say something to enlarge on the historical point made in the preamble to this talk. The half-century from about 1880 to 1930 is of great importance. It was a time when artists and designers came to terms with contemporary philosophy and with the analytical methodology of the natural and social sciences. This was the context in which the writing of manifestos developed, and it's still a very important period for artists and designers. Landscape architects were not early responders, but have drawn on the static geometry of cubism and neoplasticism. With some exceptions, perhaps including Christopher Tunnard and Dan Kiley, this was not done wholeheartedly. My belief is that there's more to learn from the principles of suprematism and constructivism. As Gabo and Pevsner put it, Space and time are the forms on which life is built and art must be constructed. We should therefore construct our work as the universe constructs its own. Architecture is a static art. Landscape architecture is a dynamic and kinetic art. Geometry matters, but the laws of nature matter more. They gave the universe its form, and its form is always in flux. What follows from this appreciation has come to be called the landscape urbanism design method. In my book, this is a method which relates to the principles of constructivism, but it is constructive and not constructivist. Like Mother Nature, the method prefers subtle strategies to master plans. As well as dreaming about the purity of the platonic forms as they were used in minimalist land art, we need to think about the flow of water, the rush of the wind, the heat of the sun, the formation of soils and the growth of plants. The interplay of these forces of nature can be guided somewhat 
to generate shape, mass and texture. In a static form, you can see this in the Perspex maquette made in 1928, which became Naum Gabo's revolving torsion fountain in 1972. It's very beautiful, but it's only a work of art. The chadars and water channels in Indian gardens were used to supply irrigation water, while also delighting the viewer's eye and soul.